Uh, so the second session will have seven talks, 15 minutes each. And uh, the first speaker is Simon Glover, uh, who will tell us about H2 region trapping in POP3 accretion disks. Thanks, Simon. And okay. I'll give more warnings at three minutes and one minute. Thank you. And, and thank you to the organizers for giving me the, the chance to talk about this today. So I want to start by um, thanking my collaborators. And in particular, I want to highlight Andre Yara, um, because he, the work I'm going to be talking about today is basically the project that he carried out in the second half of his PhD thesis. So um, we've already heard quite a lot about POP3 star formation. And I just want to take a minute or two to just remind everybody of, of what the kind of current consensus picture is. Um, basically, if we have a mini halo cooled just by H2, we know that it cools, collapses, but it doesn't cool as much as uh, we would see in a normal GMC in the in nearby universe. So the temperature remains reasonably high. And this high temperature implies a high mass inflow rate. So mass flows into the center of these objects at a much higher rate than is typical, uh, again, in, in the local star formation. And this rapid inflow of mass, combined with the fact that you have non-zero angular momentum, builds up a massive popular accretion disk that becomes unstable and fragments. So we've seen a number of examples of this already. This is just another one from a recent paper by Katarina Wallenberg that I wanted to highlight. Now, there are some points of contention here, as we've already heard, mainly how many fragments form and what happens to them, how many of them actually merge with each other versus get ejected from the system. But I think there's general agreement that one or more of these fragments is going to survive down at the center of the halo, is going to accrete enough mass to become a massive star. And once these this massive star or, or these massive stars, if you form more than one, contract to the main sequence, they're going to become sources of ionizing photons. And most of the previous numerical work on this, um, including some of the simulations we've heard about today, then find that the ionizing radiation produced by these massive stars escapes to large distances in the halo um, and ultimately shuts off accretion by shutting off the supply of gas to the disk and ultimately photo evaporating the disk. So this is kind of the the consensus picture. So this is just an example um, from a paper from a few years ago by Stacey et al, where you can see the growth of these um, regions of ionized hydrogen as a function of time. Or there's another um, study from a few years ago by Takeshi Hosokara, again, um, showing, first of all, the outbreak of a, a photodissociation region in the in the polar regions of the disk and then that's, this is followed later on once the stars become more massive by the the outbreak of an h2 region which ultimately photoionizes all of the gas and gets rid of the disk now um, we wanted to investigate the impact of radiation on the disk in more detail um, so what we did a couple of years ago, we we'll start carrying out a series of simulations of this um, using the a repo moving mesh code. So the, the basic setup we're using here is we're starting with simplified initial conditions. We start with an unstable Bonner Ebert sphere with a mass of a few thousand solar masses uh, in the initial density at the center of a few times 10 to the four particles per centimeter cubed. We give it some initial rotation and a small level of turbulence uh, and then follow its gravitational collapse and see what happens. Um, we're using the, the standard treatment of primordial cooling and chemistry. Um, I can talk about these at great length if anybody's interested. Um, and we're following the collapse until we get up to number densities of around 10 to the 14 particles per centimeter cubed, at which point we're replacing any regions that are still undergoing gravitational collapse using sink particles. Um, once we have sinks that have become sufficiently massive that we expect them to be sources of UV radiation, so once they get to masses of like 10, 20 solar masses, we then follow the uh, propagation of UV radiation, both um, photodissociating radiation and ionizing radiation around all of these sinks using the spray algorithm. Um, and I should stress we're actually following the radiation from all of the uh, sources that we form in the simulation, not just the one central one. 
Now, thanks to the moving mesh uh, nature of a repo and its um, high computational efficiency, we're able with these simulations to reach uh, extremely high resolutions close to the sink. So we reach sub AU spatial resolutions. So this is just um, an illustration of that. So once we get up to densities characteristic of the center of the accretion disk, the region around the sink particles, uh, which is number densities of 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 particles per centimeter cubed. We have sub AU sized cells with typical masses of about 10 to the minus five cellar masses or below. So these are very high resolution simulations. So that's the basic setup. And since I only had a small amount of time, that's gone through that very quickly. Um, but I'm happy to talk at greater length in the comments later about the, the details. So what did we find? Well, the big surprise that we found with these simulations, which in retrospect shouldn't have been the big surprise, um, is that ionizing radiation didn't seem to do anything. Um, so here's an illustration of this. So this is the state of the simulation at the point where we have a massive binary. So two central stars, both of which have masses of around 30 or 40 solar masses. So they're, these are bright sources of ionizing radiation. And yet when you look at the density distribution, when you look at the temperature distribution, there's no real impact of this ionizing radiation on the surrounding gas. Um, so what's going on? Well, if we look at the actual chemical composition, we see that what's going on is the gas has remained mostly neutral. Within the disk, it's highly molecular, and the ionized gas is all trapped in the center of the disk. It's not broken out of the disk into the polar regions. It's just sitting down in the center and it's unable to escape. So why does this happen? Why does the H2 region get trapped down in the center of the disk? Well, we've looked at this in some detail, and basically what's going on here is just that at these densities, um, the size of the stronger radius you create is very, very small. The typical disk density is around 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14, particles per centimeter cubed, at that density, your stronger radius obviously depends on your ionizing photon flux per second. But even for the most massive stars, your stronger radius is 0.1 of an AU or 0.01 of an AU. It's tiny. It's very close to the central star and much smaller than the scale height of the disk. The scale height of the disk in the central regions here is a few AU. So your initial ionized region is very small. Um, and then if you look at the force balance, if you look at the forces acting on this ionized gas, so the radiation pressure force and the thermal pressure force trying to push it outwards and the gravitational attraction of the gas and the star responsible for the ionization, you find that gravity wins. And this is illustrated in this plot. So the solid lines here are the gravitational attraction is a function of distance from the star for stars of several different masses and also the blue line here is showing what happens if you don't have a star, if you just have the central gas. And then the dashed lines are how much um, combined radiation and thermal pressure is pushing outwards. So you see, if you didn't have the star there, then re uh, the pressure of the H2 region would dominate, the H2 region would expand, it would escape from the disk, no problem. But as soon as you actually put a central source there, its own gravity stops the H2 region from expanding. It traps it within the disk. The, the H2 region can't expand out of the disk because even though it's overpressured compared to its surroundings, it's, it's trapped there by gravity. And I said at the start that this shouldn't have been a surprise. And the reason is we actually already have encountered this kind of behavior in simulations of massive star formation, but it's in simulations of present day massive star formation. So this is actually, this is a known issue, the big difference with present day massive star formation, well, there's two of them. One is um, you have much more radiation pressure so because you have dust. Um, so it's much easier for even a, a moderately massive star to eventually reach the point where radiation pressure wins out over gravity. And secondly, um, you have much smaller um, typical mass inflow rates, mass accretion rates onto your stars. So again, it's easier for the effects of the ionization to over, overcome the effects of the inflow. Um, but you do not have this in this case, thank you. Oh, so um, what does this re result depend on? Why do we find this behavior and everybody else finds something else? Well, this result depends crucially on two things. First, resolution. 
If you're not resolving the disk scale height, you're not going to see this behavior. And second, um, the treatment of the gas close to the star. So when we are using sink particles here, what we're doing is a kind of skimming technique. We put in a sink particle with some accretion radius. But we don't take away all of the gas within that accretion radius. We remove the gas down to some threshold density so that the um, time step doesn't become impossibly small, but we don't remove all of the gas. So we don't create an artificial hole in the density distribution as used to be the case when we were doing this with SPH. And this means that we allow the setup allows us to inject the radiation at the actual location of the stellar surface. So on a sub AU scale, rather than at the boundary of the sink. Um, and this makes a huge difference. If you put in the radiation at the edge of your sink and your sink is larger than the size of the disk, if it's larger than the scale height, then basically your sink pokes out of the disk. And if you do simulations with that setup, so there's, here's an example where we deliberately use that approach where we took a large sink radius and put in the radiation at the edge of the sink, then your H2 region can escape. Then it can escape into the polar regions um, and do all the usual things that we've seen already. So if the sink radius is bigger than the scale height and you put the radiation in at the edge of the sink rather than where the actual star actually is, then the radiation imme immediately escapes. But that's kind of by construction. You've, you've chosen to inject the radiation into these regions that are already at low densities. Um, if you don't do that, if you try and do something more physical, then you find that the radiation doesn't actually get out. So what does this mean? Are we, are we claiming that all H2 regions are actually trapped in the disks and we never actually ionize the surrounding gas? Um, I don't think we can make that claim yet um, for a couple of reasons. One, we need to run the simulations for much longer. With, with this set of simulations, we're able to follow the evolution for 20,000 years, but this is still a fairly small fraction of the lifetime of these stars. Um, and you could imagine that at later times, if you have less gas being supplied to the disk, the densities drop and it becomes easier for the HD regions to break out. That's unclear. We need to, we need to go on for much longer. Secondly, um, we're clearly missing some physics here. So one thing that we've already heard about is magnetic fields. If you can build up a strong magnetic field in the disk and drive a jet, that's going to punch holes in the disk and that might allow radiation to escape. And the second important bit of missing physics, although we're treating the direct radiation pressure of the ionizing radiation, we're not treating the effects of Lyman alpha scattering, which um, potentially is going to give you a much larger radiation pressure while the H2 region remains trapped because the photons just scatter backwards and forwards and contribute more than once to the actual total radiation pressure. So it could be that these effects, if we account for them, are actually going to allow the H2 regions to escape. So the real point to take away is I think these simulations demonstrate we still don't have a good understanding of the early sta stages of growth of H2 regions about round pot three stars. We know what happens once you've escaped from the disk. We don't know how they get out of the disk. And they may become trapped in the disk for extended periods. And they also show that if you really want to simulate this, high resolution close to the star is vital. If you're not resolving the scale height of the accretion disk, if you're not resolving the gas distribution immediately around the massive stars, then you're actually going to get qualitatively different results from what you find if you do that. Um, yeah. And so if you take one thing away from this talk, it's that we really need extremely high resolution to model this process. And I don't think any simulations really are quite there yet. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Simon, for finishing on time. And we have uh, several questions on the Slack. So I'm going to just uh, uh, read, I guess, the, them in order. Uh, so John Reagan asks, would you not have expected this from a simple cloudy calculation? Uh, because in the SMS simulations, supermassive star simulations very with very large mass inflow, we have uh, found something similar. Massive pop P stars do not create large H2 regions. It's interesting that the results are similar and it's good for growing stars. We, so. we, 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 should have under, we should have expected this from reading the, the present day massive star formation literature, but uh, it's, it, it, it's, one of, it's one of these cases you don't actually realize until you see it in your own simulations. <laughs> uh, so uh, actually, let me jump to one that uh, uh, Kazil 
Sugimura asked, which I, I wanted to ask myself, is uh, are the protostars physically embedded within this, even very close to the protostars? And my version of the same question was, is the initial condition self-consistent in the sense that uh, if you started to shine the UV light earlier, maybe you would not have built this dense disk very close to the star. So can you comment well, on that? Well, you need to you need that dense gas close to the star to build up the star in the first place. We're, we're, we're not plonking in the star with 20 or 30 solar masses. It's growing by accretion from its surroundings. And unless you have some physical mechanism for switching off that accretion, that gas is still going to be there. Um, and what our simulations are showing is that the photoionization by itself is not sufficient for clearing out that gas in the immediate surroundings of the star. Now, it could be that the, the the missing physics I've talked about, the Lyman alpha radiation pressure sure. or yeah. the magnetically driven jets can do that. Um, but the the ionizing radiation by itself can't. Uh, so there was another one, I think last one by Jen Chiaki. Uh, great result. If you could follow the radiation transfer for the whole time of the main sequence, can the H2 region eventually expand to the parsec scale as larger scale and lower resolution simulations found in the past. I think you kind I, of told us, but you want to say something else? I, we yeah, I can't, I can't really answer that. I mean, I think once the H2 region manages to escape and start ionizing the surroundings of the disk, then things are going to proceed pretty much how we've seen them in previous simulations. But how long it takes to get to that point, I think we don't know. Um, I, think, I think the real point to take away from this study is yeah, we don't. We still don't know the answer to this question. All right, stay tuned then. Uh, thanks, Simon, again for great, great uh, talk. Very interesting result. Uh